It may be that you have a Bible with you. If you don't, you want to follow along. There's a, a Bible in the queue. But I'm looking at Galatians chapter 3 tonight. And I want to look at a few verses here for just a few moments. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number uh, 10. And I want to read these verses. It says this, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. It says, that, uh, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 13 says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. I want to talk just for a few minutes about the real tree of Christmas. Did you ever wonder where Christmas trees came from? Did you ever ask yourself that question? Uh, The first person to bring a Christmas tree into a house, uh, the way that we know it today, may have been the 16th century Protestant reformer, a man by the name of Martin Luther. The story is told that one night on Christmas, uh, uh, actually it was the night before Christmas, he was walking through the forest He looked up into the sky, saw the beautiful stars, and they were shining through, it seemed like, the tree branches That as he was looking up. And it was so beautiful to him that night. And so he went home and he told his children that that whole scene there reminded him of Jesus who left the stars of heaven to come down here to earth at Christmas. And so this is what he did. He got a tree and he brought it into his house for his children and he put candles on the tree And he put a star on the top of the tree to represent the star of Bethlehem. And as he would do this, he quoted a verse from the scripture. He quoted from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 13, where it says, The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree, and the cypress together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And so from the very beginning, for Martin Luther... For him, there was much symbolism in the tree and the candles on the tree, which represented the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. The star, of course, on the top of the tree representing the star that guided the wise men to uh, the birthplace of the Lord Jesus. And, of course, the evergreen tree itself. Uh, Martin Luther would say that would represent to his heart the everlasting life that the Lord Jesus comes Uh, to offer us when he came to this earth to die on the cross. Now, this whole idea of this tree kind of spread all throughout Germany, and then it began to spread throughout the United Kingdom, and then here to the U.S. in the early part of the 19th century. And that's where we get this whole thing of, of the Christmas tree. Now, and that's all good and fine. I know sometimes around this time of year, I meet some people, they say, you know, Christians should not have Christmas trees, and they're kind of against it. But I normally say, please don't take my Christmas tree from me, all right? I enjoy all of that about Christmas, and there's a lot of symbolism and all that. And that's all good and fine. But what I want to talk to you about here for just a few moments is the real tree of Christmas. Because, dear friend, let me just tell you that the real tree of Christmas is not one of decoration, It is one of degradation, I should say, or humiliation. And the gift was not under the tree. The gift was on the tree. And the gift was not wrapped. The gift was stripped. And friend, I'm talking, of course, about our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about the tree. Uh, The real tree of Christmas is the old rugged cross, not the evergreen tree that we love to decorate, although it's so very beautiful. But the real tree of Christmas is the old rugged cross. And the Apostle Paul here refers to the tree In verse 13, where it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. In fact, Paul said that this tree brought with it a curse, and cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And it it seems almost blasphemous that the Apostle Paul would say that the Lord Jesus Christ who hung on that tree was a curse, or he became a curse for us. But friend, that's indeed exactly what happened there on the cross at Calvary. So you say, how can that be? Let me just tell you real quickly how. First of all, there's the creation of the curse. And we see this in Galatians 3.10, where Paul says this, that as many are under the works of the law, under the curse, for it's written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things that are written in the law. Now, did you under, do you know that there's a curse on humanity today in general? Do you understand that? You say, where does this curse come from? Well, friend, let me tell you something. We serve a holy God. We have a holy God. And God must judge sin. 
And the Bible tells us that very clearly. And the curse comes from those who cannot fulfill God's demands, the, the, the demands that the law gives us. And God made that very clear in the Old Testament. You might remember the story when God said to the nation of Israel after they crossed over in the land of Canaan, half of them were to stand on a mountain called Mount Gerizim and the other half on a mountain called Mount Ebal. And there was kind of a natural amphitheater valley there in between. And the, and the law would be read by someone down in the valley. And every time the law would speak about obedience, those on Mount Gerasim would say amen. Every time the law would speak about blessing, those on Mount Gerasim would say amen. But then when they got to reading the law and it said, cursed is those who don't obey God, everyone on Mount Ebal would say amen. And so it was one big giant object lesson. And here was the lesson. If you obey God's law, there will be blessing. That's Mount Gerasim. But if you disobey God's law, There will be cursing. There was the Mount Ebal was the mountain of cursing. And by the way, they built an altar right there on the base of that mountain. You know why? Because they would need that altar because of the curse that would bring, that would come from disobedience. That altar would point to the the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, where he would shed his blood for all those who could not obey the law. So really the curse comes from those who cannot obey the law. That's the cause of it. Then you see, here's the, here's the deal, friend. There's only two ways you can go to heaven. One is, if you obey all of the law of God, that's one way. But how many here would be willing to say tonight, by the way, don't raise your hand, I've obeyed everything that God said. I've obeyed all the law of God. No one of us can say that. And so therefore, the Bible says there's a curse upon mankind because we can't continue in all these things that are written in the law. There's the curse, the cause of it, but then there's the circumference of it. It says everyone, all. Cursed is all, and then all the things that are written in the law. In other words, this curse includes everyone, Jew and Gentile, no matter what your background is, no matter what your race, no matter where you're from. If you can't obey God's law perfectly, God says, therefore, the curse of the law is upon you. And you can't, and you can't pick and choose what part of the law that you want to obey. It's all the law, everyone. That's kind of the circumference of it. And so you see, dear friend, all of humanity, therefore, is under the curse of the law, because we can't obey it. You say, well, what's, what's the law for? Well, and this is the second part, the condemnation of the curse, not only the creation of it, but the condemnation of it. You see, what the law does is it demonstrates that all of us are sinners. Someone might say, well, why did God give us a law that we couldn't obey? The purpose of the law is to show us that we can't obey, that in and of ourselves, all of us are sinners. You see, the law is like a mirror. How many of you stood before a mirror before you came here tonight? I think all of us, right? A mirror can show you what you are, but a mirror can't change you, right? Uh, You might say mirror, mirror on the wall. You can say that all you want to, but a mirror can't change you. A mirror can show you where you need to be changed, and that's what the law does. The law can't change us, dear friend, but it can show us where we are uh, faulty. It can show us where we come short of what God expects and the law is also kind of like a teacher. In fact, Paul says that in Galatians 3, 24, that the law is our schoolmaster. It teaches us to, uh, that we need the gospel, that we're not a bit able to obey God's standard. And so it points us to the real source of salvation because we're not able to live up to it. In fact, what the law does is the law kind of beats us down. The law kind of shows us how sinful we are, but then it prepares us. It kind of tosses us over. It points us over to uh, the gospel of grace. How many of you are baseball fans? I know it's football season, but did you know that the Chicago Cubs years ago, they had two players. They had a, they had a guy who played third, third base. His name was Vance Law, and they had a guy who played first base. His name was Mark Grace. And you know what? For one summer, one glorious summer, the Chicago Cubs showed us the gospel every time they played baseball. You say, how did they do that? Well, when a ball would be hit down third base and Vance Law would knock it kind of down in the dust, then he'd pick it up. He would throw it over to Grace and get the guy out. There's the gospel right there in front of you. See, that's what the law does. The law uh, it kind of knocks us down into the dust. It shows us that we're unable to really obey God the way we should. But what the law does is the law tosses us over to grace. And and that's what we need to save us. You see, grace is all about Jesus coming to this earth to, to die for our sins. You see, the law pinpoints sin, 
It tells us what sin is. The law provokes sin. Actually, what the law does is it shows us how sinful we are because it kind of provokes us. It shows us that we have a sin nature. You ever, you ever um, see a sign that says wet paint? What's the first thing you do? You touch it, right? Why do you do that? Because that law there kind of provokes you, doesn't it? You ever hear someone say, no one's going to tell me what to do. There's kind of that stubbornness in all of us where we don't want to be guided by laws. Well, the law actually shows that we all have this disposition towards sin and rebellion in us. And so we're hopeless. We have no hope in and of ourselves. The law will pinpoint sin. The law will provoke sin. And then the law will prosecute sin. But friend, the law can't help us. But let me, let me just give you the third thing real quickly. And we'll be done. And that is the cancellation of the curse. So there's this curse that dwells on mankind. But thank God, this is what Christmas is all about. Again, listen to verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Christ redeemed us. That is, he paid the purchase price for us. You see, all of us were, all of us are sinners. We can't obey God's law. We all fall short. There's nothing we can do. There's a curse that's upon us because of God's holy demands. We can't live up to it. But here's what God did. He sent his son Jesus into this world. This is the purpose of Jesus coming. Born in Bethlehem, born of the virgin. He lived a sinless life. He fulfilled all the law's demands himself. And then on the cross, the Bible says that he really became a curse for us in our place. Friend, it should have been us. The curse of God should have fallen upon us. But instead, on the cross, Jesus took all of our sins And the curse of the law, instead of falling on you and me, it fell on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul means when he says, being made a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Now, in the Old Testament, whenever the Jews believed that a man was cursed, he was hung on a tree. And there's many stories. I don't have time to tell you about that. But so when the Jews saw the the supposed Messiah... Jesus hanging on the tree in their mind, they're thinking, how can he be the Messiah if he's hanging on a tree? That's, that's a, whoever hangs on a tree is cursed. How can he be the Messiah? But you see, they didn't understand. But Paul's showing them right here. The reason he became a curse is because he took all of our sins upon himself. He became a curse for us. He indeed is the Messiah. And he did bear the curse so that we wouldn't have to. And that's the blessing And he says this in verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise. And the promise, dear friend, is the promise of salvation. And so Jesus came to bear the curse for us, to give us salvation. And let me tell you something, dear friend, very clearly, you're saved by putting your faith in what Jesus did for you on the cross. That's the only way. There's there's no other way. You can't get saved by obeying the law. None of us can do that. We get saved by putting our faith in what Jesus did for us. By the grace of God on the cross, he died for our sins. Let me just close with this story. Uh, Years ago, I was witnessing to a man. He was kind of a pessimistic personality, very negative about everything. You ever meet people like that? They just seem to never see the bright side of anything. They're always negative. And I started witnessing to this man, and he would say over and over again, you can't help me. I'm cursed. God cursed me. And I say, what? Oh, yeah, I'm cursed. And so every time I would witness to him, he would go back to this line. I'm cursed. I'm cursed. And one day I was driving him to church, and I again began to share the gospel with him. And he went on that line again. Oh, I'm cursed, preacher. I'm cursed. And suddenly the Lord gave me an idea. And I said to this man, you're right. You are cursed, man. He said, you believe that? You, you, you mean you believe I'm cursed? I'm like, yeah, you're cursed. You're cursed really bad. He said, I knew it. I knew it. He said, how do you know? And I read this verse here, Galatians 3.10. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things that are written in the law. And he said, oh, no, preacher, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I said, well, you have to get this curse removed. He said, well, how do I do that? And then I read him verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. I said, listen, the only way you could ever get this curse removed is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ who bore your sin, who became a curse for you. 
And suddenly, it was like the light bulb went off in his mind. Suddenly, he understood the importance of Jesus. And he prayed to receive Jesus Christ into his heart. And you know what? The curse was removed. Friend, how about you? Has Christ removed the curse for you? We sang the song, Joy to the World. Remember the one line? No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. As far as the curse is found. He's come to remove that curse from us. He's come to give us everlasting life. And friend, if you don't know Jesus, I would just encourage you tonight, don't leave here without knowing that Jesus is in your heart, that the curse of sin has been removed, that you know that you're saved, you've placed your faith in him and him alone. That's why we do all this. We want you to know Jesus. Let's bow together for prayer. And so, Father, I pray that you'll take these words and that you will just burn them into the heart of every person here tonight, that if there's someone here that's never trusted Christ, that right now, this very moment, they would reach out in faith and pray these words And friend, if you're here, would you just say this? If you've never trusted Jesus, could I just lead you in this prayer? Just say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me for Christ's sake. And Lord, remove this curse of sin that is upon me and upon all of us. I put my faith in Jesus and him alone. And friend, if you've prayed that and you mean that, you know what? You're saved according to the word of God. If you'll pray that and mean it. God will give you eternal life. He'll forgive you for your sin. He'll give you eternal life. Anyone here say, preacher, that's me. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I want to pray for you. And by the way, you, we'll be here after the service. Just come and let us know that you have prayed that. Father, bless again these words to hearing hearts. Thank you again, Lord, for the privilege of just being here. And we pray in Jesus' wonderful, matchless name. Amen.